Good morning. How's everybody doing? Let's pray. We're going to worship the Lord this morning. He would stand up and uh, take the fighting position. We're going to fight against the enemy this morning. And when we worship, that's our weapon. So let's take that before the Lord this morning. Lord God, we just come before you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the power of the resurrection. And God, we choose to stand in that power this morning. We choose to stand in your victory. And we come before you, before the cross, and just lay down our lives. We lay down our burdens this morning, Lord God, and we choose to worship you. Amen. Amen.
spirit sound rushing wind fire of god fall within holy ghost breathe on us we pray as we repent and turn from sin revival
just worship you. We lift our voices, God, to praise you. You are our great God.
the greatest God. He wants you to know today that he sees each one of you. Even though there are billions of people on this earth, he sees you. He knows you. He knows the number of hairs or none on your head. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, he loves you. And he wants you to know today that you are seen. That you are not just one of the masses. Let him call to your heart today. Father, we thank you that you see us. We thank you that you are El Roy, the God who sees we thank you, Father God, that you love us because we need you. Father, I ask today for those who don't know you as their Lord and Savior, that you would call to their heart that the fact that the God of the universe sees them and loves them individually, let that penetrate let it penetrate the areas of our lives where we feel lost and unseen. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to pour out today to minister to each individual heart as only you know how. Called you here today, Holy Spirit. We invited you here. We ask that you will show yourself mighty and strong today. Father, we ask for the words that you have given Pastor Mike to speak today would be like honey, honey to us, Lord, that we would just eat it up in our spirits, that we would have eyes and ears to hear. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. So glad that you're here with us this morning. If it is your first time with us, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, we just ask that you fill out one of our Keeping in Touch forms, which should be in the bulletin for you. And then at the end of the service, you can just go to the welcome desk just outside the auditorium here and hand that in. We have a gift for you. I'd just love to chat with you a little bit. If it's not your first time here, we also ask that you fill it out a Keeping in Touch form. There are some wicker baskets in the back of the room here you can place those in. Or you can go on the app as well, our app, and you can just hit Keeping in Touch form right in the bottom middle. And then it's just, you know, one click and you're all good to go. Also, if it's your first time here, please do not feel obligated to give. And also, if you've been here before or consider this your church home, you know, you can give online. You can give in the white bins on the back there. Um, you can give through the app. Um, so that's another way you can worship in that way. All right, so we have a few of things coming up. A few of uh, things. Wow, I'm just adding syllables now at this point. <laughs> Sound like Daffy Duck up here. All right, so um, in the bulletin, you'll see those things. We have a blood drive coming up on Friday, so we ask that you just go to our website, wearethatchurch.org. You can find the blood drive link right there. We ask that you pre-register. It just helps with scheduling. It happens right here in the auditorium. It's very comfortable as it can be giving blood. I get it, but it's another way to give, you know, kind of give back. And also we have the if table coming up here, the cookie swap. Uh, this is for the ladies out there. So we had meet the other week for the men, you know, getting together and hanging out. Now this one's for the ladies. Uh, so again, go on our website, wearethatchurch.org. You can sign up for that. And it's a neat thing. If you've ever been to one of the if tables before, uh, you don't need to worry about that like awkward small talk. They, you kind of sit in different tables and they have prompts already built into it to the night, so it just makes for a nice conversation, get to know each other a little bit better. All right, so we don't have a transition video today. We're trying that out just for a, to shake it up a little bit. So just, um, the first service kind of let me down here. So let's f make Pastor Mike feel welcome, and welcome Pastor Mike this morning. Yeah, first service, are we on? Are we on? Do you hear me? Jim, are we on? Okay. So, yes. So, hey, now, hey, Kurt, now I know what it felt like. <laughs> now, I did leave him hanging for a service, and he's like, yeah, my Master Mike. I'm like, getting my stuff ready. I'm like, I didn't realize I was going to get the introduction like that. So, thanks. So, yeah. So, first service, I asked everybody if they've transitioned out of their Thanksgiving pants into their Sunday pants now. So, that we got like that little extra room in there. I know I have. So, let me ask you guys this question. I got a fun one here. So, this could be a debate because I know I got yelled at last Sunday night at youth group for this. But, um, 
When do we start listening to Christmas music? It is after Thanksgiving, but is it like now or do we wait for December 1st or now? Oh, okay, okay, okay. I got you. July. <laughs> Christmas in July. All right. I mean, I think you've talked to Natalie a little bit too much on that one. <laughs> All right. So on a little bit more of a serious note. So as we go out into this world, we can see a lot of things going on around us. We see a lot of things that maybe like this world is like falling apart. We think, see things that are in disarray, things that do not line up with what we see or what, how, the ways that we perceive how we should be living. We see things like fear, worry, shame, all the uh, confusion, but we can remain calm because we know that we have a God that is not a God of confusion, but one that is of order. But you see, all too often, we see the people of the world, people around us going crazy, but yet they call us the crazy ones. They call us as the ones that, how can you just sit there? This world is falling apart, but yet we know that we can take confidence. We can take stake in the fact that we know we have a Savior who is that solid, firm foundation, that is that rock that we know will not be shaken, that will not be moved. So if being called a crazy person because I have a firm foundation as a Savior who will not be moved, then so be it. I'm crazy. So... If this is your first time here, welcome. This is our crazy people service or series. And so we'll go a little bit more into detail about that. And well, join me if you're crazy. So let's pray. So Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for these opportunities where we can come share your word, but also, Lord, that we can dive into your word and be able to share and be able to be a part and be one with you, God. And Lord, we invite you here. We invite the spirit into this room, Lord, that we may be able to be able to speak life into this. Lord, let the words come off the page. Let it be able to be visible, be seen, Lord. But also, Lord, just allow it to be able to be ruminating in our hearts and our minds, Lord, and just be able to, that we can walk these words out. And Lord, we just pray and we can live them and be a shining light, bright and example of who you are in our lives, Lord. And Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So a few years ago, my family and I, we would travel down to the shore and we would go vacation every year, take a week off, and we would go to the beach. We'd go to Ocean City, New Jersey. And one of the things that we always did when we were there was we'd always visit the amusement park. And now I remember there was one point, one year that my son, my oldest son, I'm not going to name drop him, Zeke, he's sitting right there. Um, <laughs> he got really excited. He, got really, he was looking forward to it because he got to the point where he was tall enough now to ride the big boy rides. Okay, and what this meant, there was like the log flumes, the roller coasters, all that kind of stuff. And we did that. When we actually got to the park, he was there. He rode through each and every one of them. But the one that he anticipated the most, the one that he couldn't wait for was the pirate ship. He got on that pirate ship. He's like, Dad, let's go. I was like, all right, let's do this. We got on there. We rode it. He got so excited. He was so, he was so thrilled that he could do this, that when we got off, he's like, how oh, can we go again? And I was just like, sure. So this time we got back on it. This time we sat all the way in the back. And we're sitting there, and it starts to take off. And he's excited. But then all of a sudden, I look over to him. As this thing's starting to go, he's white knuckling it. He has a hand on that bar. His knuckles are whiter than white. And it, he's ready. He, like, you're waiting for this bar to snap. OK, that's how much it. But at any rate, you can see that in his face that everything was dropped. There was no smile. There was no excitement. There was just fear. He was coping. He was just like, he could not wait to get off of this ride. When the ride finally came to a stop, he practically ran off. He got off of this thing. I was like, yo, buddy, what happened? Where did you go? What, you know, what happened? He's like, he's like, Dad, my foot slipped out the side while this thing was going. And he was all I thought and all I felt was that I was going to fall out. He was so overcome by the fear, the worry, and the dread that he was going to come basically die. He was going to fall out of this, that he experienced a moment of temporary anxiety, so much so that that overwhelmed him to the point that he made this vow that said that I am never going on that ride again. And he's held true to that. So, you know, <laughs> good way to stand firm on that, buddy. All right. But needless to say, understand, though, he is fine to this day. 
He f- experienced that temporary, that moment of anxiety. But you see, it's all too often, many people experience that every single day of their lives. They wake up and they are overcome with the feeling of anxiety that they cannot move. They are overwhelmed by the idea at experiencing what it is to go through life in fear, worrying about what's going to happen, and knowing that there's going to be dread throughout their day, so much so that they're understanding that everything that is going to come at them is going to be a threat to them in some way or another. Now, experiencing occasional or temporary anxiety is a part of everyday life. Think about it. Anytime that you have a test that you have to take, you're going to get nervous. You're going to have a little bit of fear in there about that. Or even traveling for the holidays. Maybe it's something that you don't want to do. Going home for Christmas might be a little overwhelming to some people. Or even maybe this time of year just as an experience all in and of itself because it's something new where you might be missing a part of your family and this is the first time that you're doing it. Each one of these is an opportunity to be able to be overwhelmed, but I pray that we can make it through. You see, but sadly, all too often, there are people that cannot make it through. And to them, anxiety is this giant, this bear that will not get out of their way. It is fear, it is the worry, it is the anxiety, it is the overwhelmingness or the dread that comes along with it that moves from their head knowledge to their heart. It moves to them that it overcomes them and overwhelms them to the point that they cannot endure. And you see, on the other side of that too, anxiety oftentimes pairs up with depression. And usually that leads to something that's far greater and far worse. And I want to rest assured, I want to give you the confidence or I want to help you to understand that removing yourself from this world should never be an option. Suicide is never, should never be an alternative to being able to endure what is coming at you. Anxiety and depression are two major animals that will and are relentless. And yet, we know that there is ways around this. Understand that there is always somebody, hopefully somebody sitting next to you, whether it's on the right or the left, that will be able to sit here and would rather hear what you're going through and be able to listen to what you're saying rather than attend your funeral. And know that here we have options. We have groups like CR that will help you and walk you through that and be able to team up and partner with you to be able to allow you to be able to voice what you're going through and be able to help you. They come alongside you and they pair with you So that way you are not alone. Even understanding that the pastoral staff, even the prayer team, we are here to talk and listen and want to do that with you and be able to hear what what you're going through to allow you to understand that we care. And if all those options are too much or uncomfortable, understand that there is an anonymous hotline. There is an anonymous tip line that you can go to. That you It's a simple number. It's 988 that you can call, that they will sit with you and hear with you and listen to what is going on and be able to walk you through this, to know that you are not alone. See, but unfortunately, we live in a world that oftentimes dumbs it down. They think that anxiety is just somebody who's feeling sorry for themselves, somebody who has made it up or it's all in their head. And yes, to a degree, yes, it is all in their head, but it's the idea that it's in your head and it moves from there down to where it is. So to be able to be, to be narrow-minded or dumb it down to the point of just self-pity is a lot more than that. It is living in a way that you actually cannot control in some cases. It's understanding it is a matter of what you are going through. You see, for those living with anxiety every day, it is simply not just being afraid. It is not just being worried about something or even having this sense of being uncomfortable. It is a lot more to that. It is living a life that is hard to control what you are feeling and not being able to explain what you are feeling or even why you reacted to the way that you reacted to a situation that you are in. You cannot explain it. And you see, sometimes that fear that comes along with that anxiety grips you so tight that it feels like it's strangling you to the point that you are being overwhelmed by the things that would normally not bother a normal person or anybody who is not struggling with an anxiety disorder. Things like noises or sounds or even just tests and simple responsibilities. 
These are all trigger points that will send somebody off that is dealing with anxiety disorder of some form that will just be able to be like, boom. So I wanted to share something with you. This is a little bit hard because I want to share it. I have a video that I want to show with you guys. It's about 30 seconds long. If you actually, sometimes it's hard to explain something without experiencing it yourself. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to experience anxiety through this, but you will get a feel or an understanding of what it means when you actually see this. And I'll explain a little bit at the end. So my thing, though, is that if you are experiencing anxiety or you struggle with this or this is a fight, I encourage you not to watch. Okay, look away. Like I said, it's only about 30 seconds. So can you show that video? All right, so for many of us, we watch that, and it looks like just a truck that's never hitting this pole, okay? And I'm sure inevitably at some point in time it did hit that pole. It's just that through the camera angles, it was shot in different point of views, different perspectives, and all that. But it was the idea that it was the anticipation or the expectation that at some point in time that truck was going to hit that pole. That is a point that's, that, that's anxiety kind of in a nutshell. In fact, the clinical definition is the, is the anticipation and the expectation of imminent threat that may never happen or dwelling on that fear, worry, and panic, moving it from psychological to physical. And that the truck with the anticipation of hitting that pole is one of those things that would drive anybody to feel uneasy. You see, the biblical definition of anxiety is this. It says to think about or care for something or to take a thought and think it over and over and over and over and over again. It's the idea of ruminating on something. I know Bill explained a little bit of what ruminating was last week, but it's just that idea of just constantly taking that and never letting it go. You see, in times of anxiety, the body seems to be alert to be ready to do a number of things, one of which is fight. Our body gets so tensed up that the first thing, our common reaction for some people, and everybody is different, that the idea is that you lash out. If you ever saw somebody and you're trying to help them that they're struggling with going through a situation of anxiety and you try and help them, you come alongside them and their response is aggression or anger, That's the result of that. Another one is flight or flee. These are the people that do not want to be around other people. They don't want to be around groups. They don't want to be bothered. They are better off alone in a situation. They are also also sometimes these are the people that will call and cancel last minute on something all because then they don't have to be around others. And the last one is freeze. Freeze is one that is very similar to flee or flight, but it's the idea of being able to sit motionless and not be able to move. Um, do you have that picture? Okay. I know this is a humorous meme that you see floating around, but I want you guys to think about it for a second. To be able to sit in a room where everything is caving in around you, that you are just sitting there while, and in this picture, obviously displaying that the world's going up in flames around you, not being able to move, to sit there and being numb to everything, and just sitting there as a result of it, just going, everything's fine. I'm good. These are all potential signs or results of anxiety. Now, for some of you, you might be like, well, why are you talking about this? Well, I'm not a doctor, nor would I ever claim to be. But 
I'm also coming to you as somebody who struggles with this and does fight this on a regular basis. Have I conquered it? Absolutely not. Have I done this? Have I done the work? Yes. But the idea is that it's one of those things that it's an, almost like a never-ending process. But I would hope and my prayer for you is to give you the tools to be equipped, to use the same things that I'm using here to be able to go and, use, and fight this giant that looms its ugly head every once in a while. And some of this comes through the verses that I'm going to be displaying today, the passages I'm going to talk about, and that is Luke 8, 20, 8, Luke 8, 22 through 25, but also Psalm 23. Now, I'm going to encourage you guys, I would say encourage you guys to remember or memorize Psalm 23. A few years back, we had a youth retreat, and we studied Psalm 23. There's so much depth into that passage. Six little verses, but it has so much power in it. I encourage you to do that because there's so much for there to equip you for everyday struggles. But also, Luke 8.22 gives a good picture of what it looks like to travel through the storms of life. And it's a great illustration to what we're going through because oftentimes, we as a church, I mean, big C, corporate church, we want to do things. We want to try and help. We want to come alongside people. But oftentimes, and sometimes, we want to help so much that we wind up screwing things up. We make a big mistake. Because what happens is when people are going through these things, we try and help things along by giving scriptural advice that's really not biblical. Okay, And understand that you will not find any of these phrases or anything like that in the Bible. And things like, God will never give you more than you can handle. That's not in there, okay? Because truth be told that when, we're, when God wants to grow us and strengthen us, he's going to stretch us. He's going to give us more than we can handle because he wants us to come to him, okay? When we're going through that pain, that's the idea that we are feeling those birthing pains, the stretching, that growing, that confidence in him. Or God helps those who help themselves. Not there either, because the idea is that if you, ever, if you read scripture, it tells you that we're supposed to trust in him. If we're trusting in ourselves, we're not trusting in him. So therefore, we have to kind of give it back to him in that regard. And another one is, and this one actually I hear a lot with pastors, okay? Meaning that this is what they hear. And that is, you're a Christian. You shouldn't have anxiety. Really? Okay. Because, and fortunately, like I said, you know, it reaffirmed it when I heard a few other ones say this to me, and I'm just like, okay, cool. Because if that's the case, then what was, tell me what Jesus was doing in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying to ask God to take this cup away from him as he's sweating drops of blood. Or even look at David, a man after God's own heart. Look at three quarters of the Psalms. And what they deal with, anxiety, depression, fear, all these things, they are in there. These are all things. But like I said, we oftentimes use those. And the other thing that we do is we use scripture as a weapon. We beat people up with the Bible and we take things out of context or we don't understand the context of what they're going through. And we tell them, well, if you're having these troubles, cast your cares on God because he loves you. This is true. He does. But if you're dealing with a person or not understanding that a person who thinks that no one else cares in their life, you're actually hurting them. Or don't be anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious for anything. Well, when you have somebody that only knows what anxiety is and only knows a life of anxiety, that's a little bit harmful. And last but not least, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Well, when you're feeling alone at that moment and you feel like no one is there, even Christ, that is probably one of the most damaging verses that you can tell somebody who is struggling in a moment. And like I said, we use scripture out of context in certain situations. Those might have been in perfect context, but we did not understand the context of what that person is dealing with. Understanding what their struggles are. Not being able to come down alongside them and have develop a relationship or talk with them. We need to do that before we can start telling them and quoting scripture to them. And lastly, bad advice. We are good at giving bad advice. 
Okay, we tell people, well, you're facing these problems. That's all right, just get around it. Go over it. Don't even deal with it. It'll wash away. It'll, it won't even have to bother anything. Yeah, not really true. You see, because the reality is that when we have problems in our life, they're always going to be there until we deal with them, until we work through them. And as a scripture we're going to read today, until we go through them. Because that's where the strength and that's where the, the, the power that comes from Christ comes from. We have to navigate the storms of life to truly be able to navigate life itself. And as I prepared this, I was reminded of, I, I was told it was an African proverb. I don't know if that's true or not. But my youth group kids will probably be like, oh, here he goes again. Be the buffalo. Right? And you're like, what? What? So here, a little bit of context about it. It's the idea that a young man, he goes to his father who happens to be the, the elder or the chief of this, Indian, or this African village. And he says, Dad, I'm going through these problems. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm having a hard time. I'm struggling with this. His father says, be the buffalo. Don't be the cow. Kid's like, what? But what he's trying to say is, because you see, when they're out on the plains and they see the storms rolling in, the first thing they do, a cow will see the storm and it's coming in. The first thing they're going to do is turn and run the other way. They're going to run away from the storm. Unbeknownst to them and not realizing that, that they are inevitably actually going through the storm a lot longer. Because as the storm catches up to them, they're still running away from it and they are in the storm a lot longer. They have to deal with those problems. Whereas a buffalo, when he sees that storm coming in, he runs into that storm because he knows that that time in that storm is going to be a lot shorter once he gets through the other side. So be the buffalo. Now see, the picture, the paint that we see today in today's passage is very similar to that, and it's one that's very familiar to everybody. It is the storm. Okay, and it's found today, I'm using Luke 8, 22 through 25. And if you want to follow along with me, it says, One day he and his disciples got into a boat, and then he told them, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they were sailing, he fell asleep. Then a fierce windstorm came down on the lake, and they were being swamped and were in danger. They, began to, they came and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we're going to die. Then he got up, rebuked the wind and the, wa- and the raging waves, so they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? So after reading this, let me ask you this question. What does Jesus do when you are in the storm? What is he doing when you are going through it? Now, see, understand this, that the, under, the way that this goes is Jesus... Can, could control the wind and the wave. That's what we f- see face value. And this is probably the most obvious thing. And this is where we see. But to get a little depth here, you got to understand that he's coming down off the hill. He's coming down off the mount. He's in the boat. He's doing a little bit more teaching. He turns to his disciples and said, hey, let's go. Let's go out to the other side. This is also the longest point in, in, this, in the sea that they're traveling. But there's something interesting that he says here and that he does. Back to verse 22, it says, he told them, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they were sailing, he fell asleep. Just a side note here, and I think Matt can vouch for me, pastor naps are real. Want to put that out there? Okay. Okay. But you see, he took them into a spot that they were comfortable with. He took them to a point that they were very familiar with. That was in the middle of the water. They were fishermen. Most of them were fishermen, not all of them. Most of them were fishermen. They were comfortable with that. They, didn't think, they wouldn't have thought twice. They know that the only way that they could have got to where he wanted to go was to, over the water. Okay, but the idea is that he took them into a spot where they couldn't flee either. But they were comfortable. And you see, sometimes that is where our storms hit the most, where we are most comfortable. And very, and very similar to that, many of us look at that as our life story. 
We, we say that we're in the boat. Jesus is sleeping on us. We can't wake him up. We don't know where he, or what he's doing, and we don't know what to do. We're filled with panic, fear, worry. We feel alone. But the one thing that we can always take comfort in is that he may be leading us into the storm, but we know that he'll never leave our side. We know that he's always there. And we might feel like that he's sleeping on us or that he's not answering when we call on him and we begin to panic. But you see, our attention goes to our problem at hand. We start to focus, and in this case, it's on the storm. And even as a reader, we focus on the storm portion of it because, but we know that Jesus was in that boat with the disciples. He never left the disciples, and the same goes for us. He's always right there with you. He never left you. But the enemy wants you to think that Jesus leaves us. He wants us to think that we are alone. And if we, and if we feel that way, we feel as though Jesus has left us, oftentimes it is us who have changed our focus or our attention away from who he is and what he's doing in our life, and we lose sight of him. And when we feel this way, we understand that we know that he's there, but we don't know where he's at. But that's only because we left him. And then we try and say, well, I don't know where to find him. He's where you left him. You might be standing on the other side going, I'm over here. I'm over here. Come back. And sometimes that's a struggle in and of itself. But you see, when we are in the storms, Jesus wants us to focus on him not the storm. Anything and everything will pull our attention away from who God is and what he's doing in our life. And yes, yeah, sometimes the things that we are going through in our life is doing that. It's, it's very hard, but understand that those are times to strengthen us to endure what is coming around the turn, corner. It is, but you see, that's the problem is the enemy wants us to focus on the pain and not the growth. You see, one of the greatest weapons that the enemy uses is distraction. Anything that he can do to pull your eyes away from what we are going through or what we are doing or who Christ is in our life, he will sit there and he will point at that. You see, and the enemy wants us to see the storm. He wants us to see the things that are going on instead of focusing on the things that really matter, and that is God and the plan that he has for us. You see, the thing that we often do is that we hear also that, you know, anxiety is a sin. No, it's not a sin. It's an alarm that goes off in our mind that tells us it's time to go find God. Get him. Go back. Develop that relationship. Pick it up where you lost him. Okay? He is there waiting for you. Like I said, waving, waiting for you to come back. You see, that's why I say that it's an alarm. When we hear an alarm, when we hear a police siren, because we know we never hear police behind us, you know, we always want to get over. We hear the siren. That's an alarm to do something. Anxiety is that alarm for us to find him. When the check engine light goes off on your car, you don't sit there and yell at your car like, why are you doing this? You don't yell at it when the gas gauge comes on and says it's low gas. And you don't say, why are you running out of gas? No. You, it draws your attention. It pulls you there. It tells you you need to do something. And anxiety is that alarm that tells you to find God. Seek him. You see, these are the times that we might see an overwhelming obstacle, but for God, this is a time for him to say, trust me. When we see this, and I've heard it recently, that when we, we question like where God is in our plans, everything's falling apart. But the, I, I've heard it this way. It says, it's, don't seek the plan to find God. Seek God to find the plan. You see, our faith will get flushed through the storm. It comes through, and it's the things that wash away. It says that it was swamped, and it was being overwhelmed. It's that time that our faith gets flushed out. These are the things that we go through, the pain that we feel, the anxiety, anxious thoughts that go through our mind. We have to endure these, but that's the, the trust comes through the other side. That's the flushing. It's the idea of metal being purified. If you read through First Peter, it's the idea of the purification process of metal, where it comes through, the metal gets melted down, the impurities flow to the top, get skimmed off, and then when it cools, that metal is that much stronger. That is how our faith is. When it becomes, when we go through these things, we skim off the things that don't need to be there, the self-doubt, the shame, the guilt, the anxiety. When we are able to do this, we are able to make our faith that much stronger. And to understand this a little bit more, we can look to the disciples and we can see what they did. It sounds, it sounds weird. 
But in verse 24, it says, they came and woke him up saying, Master, Master, we're going to die. You see, they were panicking in that moment, the situation that they could have very well endured. After all, they've navigated the water. They've been there numerous times, but they could have done that, but they didn't. What they chose to do is go see him. And that's the thing that God wants, or Jesus wants us to do. Okay, he wants us to seek him, find him, go after him. When those times of anxiety come into play, go seek him. But sometimes we get wrapped up in ourselves. We focus on the problem at hand instead of going to him and giving the important things. And what happens is when we start focusing on all these problems, we tend to lose sight of where Christ is, as I keep saying. But then we also forsake the relationship with him. And when we forsake that relationship, that relationship is something as simple to have as prayer. You always hear us say, well, prayer is not hard. Prayer is easy. It's just a conversation with God. It is. But also, prayer is this. What David says in Psalm 23, 1, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. Everything that God offered David, David, that was all that he needed in his life. It's declaring that everything that he needed, God has to give him. And what David is also stating here is that he's putting God in a position of honor that he deserves. Similar to when Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray in verse Matthew 6, 9, he says, therefore you should pray like this, our father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Jesus is showing them to start removing all the things that you're faced with, all the problems that you're going through, everything that you have, the distance that you feel and reality ourselves too. Take ourselves out of that position of authority and put God back on that pedestal where he belongs. Put him in that rightful place. Prayer is going to God and spilling your guts, whether it is the problems that you're having, the hardship that you're going through, the pain that you're feeling, it is doing that. Prayer is also numerous things, whether it's a conversation with God, whether it's sitting in quiet, meditating on his word, or even journaling for that matter. It is an idea that we are able to paint and put our words on a page. Going to him. And when we do things like that, we're able to see him also and praise him. We can, we can do this also as a matter of going through and praise. You see, when we praise God, we are blessing God. All too often, we want his blessing, but we also we need to return that blessing to him. We praise him. We exalt him. We are stepping back and looking at how good he was to us, how good he has been, and what he is doing in our life. All the things that he has provided for us each and every step of the way. It is shifting our perspective from our own selfish wants and needs and gains to putting it on his position of authority over our lives and knowing that we have a God who loves and cares for us. And we see this come through in Psalm 23 too. It says, he lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path for his namesake. When we see this, we know that he cares for us. He loves us. We know that he has established us to be one with him. Okay, we are to be in him. And he does this. But he also causes us to take a pause. We need to pause. And you see, what we don't see in that verse, it says, then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves. So they ceased. They ceased. And they stopped. They paused. You see, as Jesus calmed the winds and the waves, he also calmed the disciples who were sitting in that boat. He, they could now have rest over what was just going on, but Jesus gave him that rest. He gave them that power to pause. Like I said earlier, they could have grabbed the oars. They could have started rowing back to shore. They could have turned. They didn't. They sought him, and he gave them the rest that they needed. You see how I said that they were in a comfortable situation, and they were a familiar surrounding all too often, when we are in familiar surroundings and we are in comfortable situations, we tend to react. You see, we tend to react in situations that we are familiar in. 
And when we do that, we are, they're almost like mindless thoughts. They're knee-jerk reactions. They are just going through the motion. They aren't leaving any room or trust for God. And then when things don't work out the way we want them to, we become overwhelmed. And next thing you know that we are at our breaking point or tipping point. And all in all, Christ just wants to give us rest. You see, in Psalm 23, 5, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. You might say, well, how does that rest? He's preparing a feast for us. Okay, understand that during a battle, a king is the only one who gets to eat at a table. Our king has provided a table for us to sit at and sit with him, to come and have rest with him. He, knowing that he is in control of every situation, he wants you to have that rest. And because of that, we know that he is in control. And, but also knowing that he is in control means that we do not have to be in control. When we are able to understand what it means to relinquish control and give it over to God, as you hear us say all and over, you will then truly understand what Philippians 4, 6, and 7 means. And it says rejoice. Nope. Nope. Six. There you go. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Okay? That prayer is going to him, having that dialogue with him, going to him with what is on your heart, feeling, developing, breaking down that relationship with him. But that petition is also the things, the cares, the anxieties, the worries that you have, the fears that you're going through. You're able to give it to him and write to him and say, God, here you go. And when we are able to fully do that and fully comprehend how we can do that, that's when verse 7 comes into play. And it says, The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God has it all under control. Not by our might, not by our power. In fact, the less that we meddle in the situation, the better off we are because we have to understand that Jesus got this. Once we understand that Jesus got this, everything is going to be great. Not going to be easy. He leads us. He directs us. He strengthens us through everything. But knowing that he is in control and knowing that we don't have to fight with him. Once we let our hands off the wheel, we can then truly develop that relationship, but also understand what Psalm 46, 10 tells us. And it says, stop fighting and know that I'm God. He is the one who is in control. He is the one who has everything. He has it all figured out. He knows who we are. We got to stop playing tug of war with him and let him have the rope. Okay? But we are able to understand this that, and understand that and develop that control with him, understanding that he has that control with us through our prayer, through the praise, and through the pause that we can have with him. And it's only then that we can truly understand the peace that comes with the role that God has for us and understanding that peace that surpasses all understanding God gives to us so that we get to carry the peace. You see, Jesus was the living embodiment of peace. He walked peace. He talked peace. He did everything and peace exuded out of him. And even the disciples missed that to the point that they did not understand what he did, especially in the following verse, that after he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, they ceased and there was a calm. They ceased and there was a calm. By his word, he spoke peace. Jesus calmed the winds and the waves. But understand, there was three parts here because the wind is only part of it. The wind, the waves was a second part. Because you can't, once you calm the one, the other one would still be raging. But he also calmed the third part. He calmed the disciples that were there in the boat. He gave them the peace that they needed to be able to understand what is going on, what's transpiring, and how they're, what, what they're going through. And through Christ, that same peace can be given to us, and we know that we can carry the spirit of peace within us. 
You see, when we receive Christ and understand his work on the cross that he did, that we receive his spirit, the same spirit that rose him from the grave, that understand that that lives in us, this is the way that we can take confidence in knowing that he is in control. And we can understand when we read verses like Psalm 23, 4, that even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. Yes, he gives us direction. He gives us discipline. But understanding that he is there to give us the comfort and the control to know that he has the situation taken for us. Understanding that we can take comfort in the storms of our life, knowing that we can rest in him because he is carrying us. But all we simply need to do is find our focus. Focus on what matters. And we do that as we read through Colossians 3 kind of sums all this up in a nice, nice package. It says, and let the peace of Christ to which you were also called in one body rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you to all, in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts and whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, as I said earlier, I'm not a doctor, and I don't claim to be, but I'm speaking to you from an idea of, hopefully, and my intentions are to equip you with the tools, the spiritual tools that you could use, dig out your spiritual toolbox when you are faced with that, when that evil dragon or whatever you want, that whatever, when that ugly monster of anxiety rears its ugly head knowing that you, have, that you have Psalm 23 or you have Luke 8 to be able to combat him and you know that you can go to work. Knowing that whatever you're going through, hopefully in time will become shorter and shorter and you're able to be equipped for more and more things. And through that, we develop the confidence that we have in Christ that we can be able to have that through prayer when we seek him, when we praise him, knowing that he has been there for us and that we, he will not fail. And knowing that we can pause and we can find rest, knowing that he is carrying us through the storm so you can find peace in the Father. So let me leave you with this final thought. And this is a verse that I've recently found that has quickly become a life verse for myself. And it's Psalm 105.4. And it says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Understanding that when we look at seek the Lord, that we are giving him our attention. We are putting our focus on him. We give him permission to shape us because what we give our attention to, we allow to shape who we are. And when we are doing, when we, oh, well, whatever. Whatever. We're going to keep going. So whatever we allow our minds to be able to be focused on, we are giving permission to allow them to shape who we are. When we focus on the storm, when we focus on the anxiety, we are giving them permission to build us up to who we think that we are based upon those two things or whatever it is that we're facing for. And what happens is we then take on the identity of those things, anxiety, depression, fear, any one of those that we throw in there, we take on that identity and we tell that's who we think that we are, but we are not. We are a child of God and we can come to him and be able to know that we can seek the Lord in all things and be allow him to be able to build us up to who we are. What better person than we can give our attention to than the one who created us, the one who has a plan for us, the one who knows who we are even before we did. And then when we seek the Lord, we seek his strength. It's not our strength that we need to seek. It is his strength. We, we got to put ourselves aside. As humans, our natural reaction is to be able to take control and rely on ourselves. Do what you have to do to get it done. No, his word calls us to seek him and seek his strength. Because that is what that means is that we have to give and have total and true surrender to the Father to be able to fully understand what it means to seek him and seek his strength because it is only then that you are saying, I'm putting myself aside, Lord, and it's all yours. And when we seek him and we seek his strength and when we seek his face, we are told throughout all scripture that we need to seek his face. 
But see, what happens all too often is we come to him and we seek and we ask, 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 come with needs, 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 instead of the one thing that we need the most, and that is him in our lives. We need him to be able to come into the middle of each and every situation that we are in to be able to truly endure each and everything that we have going on. And when we are going through those storms, when we're going through that things that we feel that we cannot face, we can rest in a father who knows that what we can do. And how often are we supposed to do these things? Always. When do we seek the Lord? Always. When do we seek his strength? Always. When do we seek his face? Always. Always means at all times. Seeking him in all things, in all circumstances, in all situations. Seeking him. As we go into this week, I encourage you to seek the Lord, his strength, his faith, in everything that you're doing. Whether it's something that is mundane, whether it's something that is simple, whether it's something that is everyday life. Understand that God is in the details, and if we look for him, we will find him in everything. So let's close. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your mighty word. We thank you, Lord, for the strength that you give to us when we seek you and we understand that you are there. We know that you are always there. You will not leave us. You will not forsake us, as your word so mightily says. But, Lord, I pray that as we are going into this, that we are equipped to understand and take those words to heart, knowing that you are there, that you will not leave us. And, Lord, knowing that wherever our focus gets pulled off of you, you are right there waiting for us to come back. You are waiting there to get our attention, to be able to say, I'm over here. Lord, I pray for these. I pray for us. I pray for each and every one of us because these are all troubles that we all face, but we all have it in different battles that each and every one of us goes through. And Lord, I just pray for our time. I pray that as we go into this week that we we not get pulled away from the distractions that are so commonly around us. We remove the whirlwind from our lives, Lord, but we are able to be able to focus on who you are and what you're doing and knowing that we can take rest in each and every storm. So Father, we thank you in this day and we thank you in every day and we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
has overcome the world. Anything that we are faced with, he has endured, he has overcome. But take heart that we know that we have a blessed Savior who does this and loves us. And I want to share this with you. Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2, it says, I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. We can put our faith, we can put our stock, we can take our heart and put everything on him, knowing that he will not be moved and he will not be shaken, knowing that we have a Savior who loves us and a God who will never leave us. And so equip your heart and understand that he is there with you and for you always. Have a great week.